Okay, for part two, now that you've gone through the initial phase of presenting to the customer the PowerPoint and the introduction of Avi, now we go to the second step, which is jumping into the demonstration. It's very important that you not get too hung up on the PowerPoint itself, because the PowerPoint is just that, it's marketing slides. But it is important because it lays the foundation for what we're about to demonstrate during this portion of the sales presentation. So as soon as we're done with the PowerPoint, we can flip into the actual demo itself, and this is when things get really interesting, and this is when customers start to lean in a bit. So the demonstration uh, portion can take as long as you need, but certainly be sure to pause and make sure that there's opportunity for interaction with the clients. Usually they're going to be a little bit hesitant at first, but as they get a chance to really see the product, they'll start opening up, they'll start asking questions, they'll start taking you down different paths. But for the most part, the core demo that we do doesn't really change very often or very far. It works, it works pretty well, and it's something that every customer will find very, very fascinating. So with that, we'll run through the demo. So we're gonna log into a demo system. In this demo system here, I'm authenticating against, uh, either against the uh, username and password of, uh, already, or I can uh, directly log in via SAML. So in this case, I'm actually going to authenticate via SAML. And I'm logged in as user Nathan and Avinetworks.com, and I'm logged into the demo tenant. From here, I've got a list of my applications. I'm gonna flip over to this virtual services tab, which allows me to go and show and see my applications. Again, the first point that to make here is that I'm logged into the Avi controller. I'm not logging into the individual load balancers or the individual service engines. You'll never log into a service engine. You're only going to log into the controller. On the back, on the front end here, I've got a number of applications, and I can see that hopefully they're all great and happy and healthy. And if not, we'll go and explore why. On the back end here, we can see that uh, turn on this tab so that you can see which service engine that each individual application is running on. This is something that we don't show by default, but it's nice that you can go and customize the look and feel to see more information and make this be more tailored. Some of these applications are running in a VMware cloud. Some are in AWS. These ones are in Azure US East Coast. This is in a Cisco CSP environment. The point is that this controller is managing applications that are deployed in different locations, data centers, clouds, and they're running on whichever load balancers that they're running on behind, under the hood, but that part isn't important. What I care about is that I've got a list of applications and hopefully they're all happy and healthy. If they're not green and happy, then let's go and find out why not. So the easiest way is just start by mousing over the health score of an application. The health score of an application is uh, a little bit different than what customers tend to be used to. Typical load balancers just have a binary up, down. If at least one server in the pool is health checking, then the service must be okay and therefore the application is green. What I'll be showing you is something a little bit more nuanced and a little less binary black and white. What this is showing is that I've got a performance score uh, which is comprised of my end user experience. Is the site fast? Is it slow? Is it spitting out errors? Has it been down during this period of time, which right now I'm showing a six hour period? Uh, I could also be having something like a resource penalty that could drag down this score. So a resource penalty could be CPU, memory, disk, and that could be on the load balancer, or that could also be on your backend application server. I've got things like anomaly penalty, security penalty. So anomaly says I expect traffic patterns to look pretty consistent Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday, there's no traffic. My site might be hell checking okay, but maybe my upstream firewall has died, or some issue like that has, has somehow been disrupting traffic. Uh, security penalty says maybe I'm getting hit with a DOS attack, maybe I've misconfigured SSL, maybe the WAF is protecting me from some sort of an attack. It's showing that you have risk to the site. So yes, the site is up, but there's definitely something we may want to explore. So if I go and drill into this application a bit, I can see a little bit more about uh, the health of the application and what's going on with it. So I'm right now I'm showing a display time of past six hours, but I could show something more real time, 30 minutes, the past day, week, month, uh, et cetera, and, and roll all the way back and see further back in time. Now keep in mind that I'm seeing this information on the controller. The individual service engine has already taken this metrics and this data, kicked it out to the controller, and the controller is uh, looking at this out of band. So now what I'm looking at is this end user experience here. The default view of the world is clients are taking about 98 milliseconds to connect across the LAN sorry, well, across the WAN on the internet, about two milliseconds for the service to pick up the connection on the LAN side, about 34 milliseconds for the application to generate the content, and about 18 milliseconds to transfer this content. So on average, at that point in time, a client's round trip time, they're seeing about 150 milliseconds of latency. If somebody calls in and says, hey, the site was slow uh, a couple of hours ago at 8 a.m. this morning, we can go back and look and see, yep, that orange bar there is much, much higher. That's the application response time. 
So the uh, average time went from 150 milliseconds to about 200 milliseconds, and it looks like that's being caused because my application servers are slowing down. So I can see that there's some sort of disruption or change. We can see a lot of other metrics and other information here. Uh, for instance, if you go and look at the view of the world from, you know, let's say, a throughput or concurrent connections or stats like this, this is where the networking team typically has very limited view of the world. This is in a typical load balancer. This is what they get. They're looking at things saying, traffic looks pretty good. I see that I've got traffic coming to the site. I don't see any issues. And this is why when the app owners are saying, hey, the site's really slow, the network team is saying, I don't see any issues. This is why the network team tends to get blamed because they don't necessarily have a strong view into what's happening. And that's why obvious default view of the world is this end user experience. There's some other interesting data here. We can see that these little uh, icons as uh, people or administrators are making configuration changes, we can go and drill into and have a complete audit log of what's happening. On the top right here, I'm doing content switching across three different pools of servers. So if someone comes to the website and they go to slash downloads, send them to the download pool of server. If they go to slash contact, go to the contacts pool, etc. Um, we can already tell that uh, the pool of servers that's uh, not green is probably the one that's causing the problems and causing some issues, and that may be where I want to go and drill into and understand more. Um, another way to go and look at this, so I'm going to go and drill into the logs. And the logs are pretty exciting because this is something where I've got a very different view of the world than I would have with any other traditional load balancer. I'm displaying right now the past six hours, and I'm filtering for significant logs or basically errors. We can also show logs that are not errors. But of the errors, I've got about 15,000 of them in the last six hours. And I can go and take any individual transaction, any individual HTTP request or uh, DNS query or whatever the protocol may be, and expand that and get a much more granular view of the world. So this is showing that uh, someone's coming in from their whatever location, from Mac OS X uh, using SSL TLS 1.2. Uh, I can see all the details about the client connection, which load balancer or service engine handled this request, the details about it, uh, what the uh, URLs that they went to, slash asset, slash avi.webm. I can see all the details about the client, where they went to, anything like this. And we can also see elements around their latencies and, and et cetera. So we marked this as significant, and actually there's a couple of interesting things that happened in this one. But the first thing is that the uh, we marked this as significant, but the application response time was pretty slow. And so what we see here is that the app response time was 98 milliseconds, and everything in blue I can mouse over and have that be a filter and say filter for anything over 98 milliseconds. And when I do that, I see a nice strong correlation with that previous page showing that that slowdown. So I'm seeing here's here's where the servers are sending out these slow responses and I can start filtering for these individual transactions of which there's about 2,000, almost 3,000 of them in the last six hours. I can go and take a look and see who the clients were, uh, what OS, what uh, other elements of this, did this impact all customers, did it impact just a subset of customers, different ways of slicing and dicing and getting an idea of who the clients were. Since this was slow application responses, I can go and take a look at the uh, um, servers to see which servers are sending out these slow responses. And 100% of these slow responses are coming from the dot .12 server. So it's not just that the application is slow, it's that this specific application server is the one that's causing these slowdowns. The point of this is that with Avi, Avi does three things. Avi makes it faster and easier to deploy applications, faster and easier to deploy load balancers, and faster and easier to troubleshoot if there's an issue. So this is an example of my health score being degraded a bit, and I can go and drill into this and start finding out what issues I might have with my site, what they might be, and what's happening there. I can take this further and, and drill into the application server itself and start showing you more information about that and finding out what the CPU memory disk I.O. is for that individual server and compare that to its peers. And what we're actually recreating here is that this application server is uh, getting really slow because uh, about every six to eight hours or so, it runs out of disk space it does a log rotation, and while it's doing that log rotation, it gets really, really slow. So you can see it's doing this fairly fairly regularly here. So just kind of different ways of getting an idea of what's going on. We can see we have another spike in traffic over here in this purple, which is the data transfer time. We can go and see what's happening with that. Why did that data transfer time take so long? And we can go and drill into that and understand more details about this. And this is the point is that we have a pretty uh, rich ability to drill into this. That's showing you about four different metrics of a virtual service. Obvious tracking uh, something close to about 700 different metrics for every application. The point of this is that it's very, very rich analytics, very rich data. All of this is being done because we have a controller-based architecture. My controller sits out of band and has the ability to take care of and do these types of uh, big data and analytics operations. 
One other quick example I'll show you about what Avi can do is if we go and create a virtual service. I said that Avi makes it faster and easier to deploy applications. So I come in to create a virtual service. I'll just do the basic mode. And this particular environment, we're deployed in this controller is talking to a number of different data centers. So we've got a number of different environments or data centers. I'm going to go and deploy this application in my VMware data center. This could be something like I've got Azure, Amazon, Google Cloud, whatever the environment may be. But I'm going to deploy my on-premise vCenter. So I'm going to give this application a name, call it Nathan. I'm going to give it an IP address. And instead of giving it directly giving it an IP address, I'm simply going to say, go and pick an IP address from this VLAN 201. The point of this is that Avi is actually plugged into IPAM. And by plugging into the IPAM, that means that I don't need to give an actual IP address to this virtual service. Avi will pick up one automatically. So the Avi controller will make an API call out to, in this case, the info box, pick up an IP, take that IP, register it in DNS, and nathan.demovip.avi.local would get registered immediately in DNS. Down here, I'm going to go create the pool and go and specify the IP addresses. I can either type in the IP addresses. I'm going to say select servers by network, and I'm going to go and look for my servers that are in network 100. And I'm going to go and search for any of them called servers. And the point here is that what's happening is that as soon as I say select by network, the Avi controller is making a call out to vCenter saying, show me the list of all your networks. I said, choose network 100. We make a subsequent call saying, show me the list of all the servers for network 100. And I want to add these four servers. I don't need to know or really care what the IP addresses of these servers are, or even if those IP addresses change. The Avi controller will figure that out for me. It's taking care of those details. I'm just saying I want to create an application. It's basic HTTP, call it Nathan, and point to server one through server four. I'll say save, and immediately this gets deployed, and I've got it up and green and happy, and it's doing a basic health check. Now, under the hood, Avi's running on hundreds of service engines, potentially. So it'd be running from anywhere from one load balancer to 100 load balancers. Which load balancer did it pick and why? I don't really know and really care. I can go and see here which load balancer, but the point is that what happened is the Avi controller then went and looked at all of its service engines, decided which ones have the best reachability, which ones have the most available capacity, and it picked one that has uh, the, that was already plumbed for these environments. If it turned out that I don't have any service engines that have capacity, then the controller would have just spun up a brand new one for me and it would take an extra minute or two while it creates and spins up a new load balancer. And what's happening is that I, as the administrator, don't need to go and take care of every single individual transaction like this. I'm just telling it what my intention is, which is I want to deploy this application and go take care of it. And this is an example of how Avi can troubleshoot easily, how Avi can deploy applications easily, and even how Avi can deploy new load balancers easily. If I didn't have capacity, a new load balancer would automatically spin up using the properties that have been pre-configured to determine what size load balancer, where this should get placed, how this should communicate. All of that has been specified one time, and now my application is up as green and as happy. So with that, we can take our demos uh, anywhere that customers want from this point. We can delve into security. We can delve into client authentication, into global load balancing, into further analytics. Um, but at this point, we generally sit back and let customers then tell us what their use cases are, tell us what their priorities are, and tell us what their challenges are with their existing load balancers. And usually from here, that we really kind of get more into a deeper conversation about the challenges and how Avi can solve those. But at this point, really, we don't have to go a whole lot further within the demo. At this point, customers are usually pretty jazzed and they're ready to go and try to do the next step, which is they want to go and log into this themselves and play with a, a live system. From here, we can then have them log into a, a demo environment where they can actually go and do all of these things on their own and walk through some uh, pre-built labs, or they can directly download the Avi software and begin a POC. So either way, we're certainly fine with, but the point is that you don't have to get a lot more um, you don't have to do a whole lot more with the, with the demo. Just being able to do that basic walkthrough and, and showcase and highlight a couple of those high level points that you're logged into a controller, not into an individual uh, service engine. Uh, the service engines have very rich analytics that they're providing, and they have very, very rich logs that can actually get into and really showcase a lot of details. I haven't done anything custom or I haven't done anything special. We can get into more advanced analytics. We can get into more advanced capabilities, but generally during a first demo, it's not even necessary. You've already shown enough that blows away customers from what they're familiar with. So with that, thank you very much.